All right. Wasn't that a powerful message last night? Amen. 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 Praise God. Huh? I'm looking forward to these uh, messages night after night. Mm-hmm. Elder Lemon, I tell you, you have just uh, opened up so much for us, and we're praise excited God. of where you're going to take us. I, I praise God that instead of being, usually you're here, it's only one week. Mm-hmm. But praise God, it's two weeks. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen for this meeting. So we want to praise God and thank you again. And of course, uh, that your family is here with you. Uh, so without further ado, uh, the first question that we have here, it says, is it still necessary to return tithes considering Paul simply says to give as you purpose in your heart in 2 Corinthians 9, 7? You know, that's a very good question. Um, there are many churches and believers in the Bible that believe that there is no longer a requirement of an actual uh, numeric figure of 10% plus an offering, but now people just say, well, you know what, just give whatever you want to give. And they use 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 as their premise. If you study 2 Corinthians 9, the best way to, to understand any Bible verse is to always read verses before and verses after. It's called contextual reading. And if you look at the verse, the first thing you'll find is that that whole entire chapter speaks nothing about tithe and offering. It doesn't even speak about it. So literally, it's like somebody's trying to inject something in the chapter that the chapter is not even talking about. Okay, so therefore, when Paul was talking about giving cheerfully, he was dealing with individuals. If you look at the previous verses one to six, Paul is actually talking about a certain group of individuals who promised to give a gift to a certain group of believers. And Paul is admonishing them. Don't forget to fulfill your promise. And then as he's telling them that, and then he reminds them, and when you fulfill your promise, don't do it grudgingly or with an attitude, because remember, God loves a cheerful giver. So this is literally what the context of the chapter is talking about. It's not even talking about tithe and offering. Now, Jesus, in the other hand, when he was speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, it got to a point where Christ was rebuking them. He literally said, woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites. And as he was going down his line of hypocrisy, he gets to verse 23 of Matthew 23. And what he says is, woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you tithe of mint, anise and cumin. But he says, but you forget the weightier matters of the law, love, justice and mercy. And then he closes out the verse by saying, these ought ye to have done and not leave the others undone. So our master, Jesus Christ himself, endorsed the returning of tithe. So therefore, there is nothing in the Bible where we ever see God repealing what he said in Malachi chapter 3, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. So according to the Bible, yes, God still wants us to return a faithful tithe and a liberal offering. Amen. All right, number two. It reads, I know God wants me to put away all sin before the judgment closes, but what about those whom I'm bitter against because of past hurts? All right. Now, that's a very real situation. All of us have been hurt. All of us have been disappointed in some shape, form, or size, sometimes even from family members, sometimes even from relatives. And we hear this message of Christianity and we say to ourselves, how do you expect me to forgive a father who molested me? How do you expect me to forgive an uncle who abused me? How do you expect me to forgive somebody who literally stabbed me in the back and I ended up in prison because he was a liar? How do you expect me to forgive people like this? Well, the Bible does give us an answer on that. It's found in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And when you go to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, I'm going to just read verses 31 and 32. And I believe that this will help many individuals overcome bitterness, anger, and resentment. Because we all have people, I would imagine, that have been in our lives that have hurt us real bad at some time or another. And sometimes that bitterness can control you and eat you up like a cancer. So as a result of that, God has a solution. Look at what it says in Ephesians 4 and verse 31. It says, let all bitterness, how much bitterness? It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So somebody says, all right, I I see Jesus wants me to put it away, but I can't. It's hard. It's in my heart. How do I get it out of my heart? Good question. Next verse. The next verse says in 32, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Watch this. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, the way that an individual will find that they can get that bitterness and anger and resentment out of their hearts is to pay close attention to verse 32. The Bible says, 
even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, story, that's true. Sitting down with a lady, she had hypertension and she had hypertension, high blood pressure, and she wanted to overcome her high blood pressure. So I asked her, I said, well, how long have you had it? She said, well, I had it for 10 years. So I said, all right, well, what happened 10 years ago? And she said, my husband left me. And I said, oh, and she said, yeah, my husband left me for another woman. And I said, really? And I said, I'm very sorry to hear that. And I said, do you forgive him? Have you forgiven him for leaving you for another woman? And she looked me in the face and she said, absolutely not. You know how you know, sisters can do that head thing? So she did that head thing. You know, absolutely not. You know, I can't do it. But, you know, she, she, was, she was making it clear, I am mad at that brother. You understand? So I said, well, sis, I said, I'll tell you this. I said, if you want to manage your disease, you can find the nearest clinic and they can help you out. But if you want to overcome your disease, only God can do that. And in order for God to help you overcome disease, you got to be on God's program. And one of the programs in God's healing work is that you must be willing to forgive as you desire to be forgiven. So she said, well, how can I do that? And I said, well, let's do this. I said, put on a piece of paper all the offenses your ex-husband did to you. Then I said, then I want you to take another piece of paper and I want you to write down all the offenses that you've done to God. And then I want you to look at both papers and I want you to tell me who did worse. So she did it and she saw clear as day that her paper about what she did towards God was a lot longer than what her husband did to her. So I said, so who's more guilty, your husband hurting you or you hurting God? She says, me hurting God. I said, well, what do you want God to do with you? She says, I want God to forgive me for what I've done. I said, then what do you think God wants you to do with your husband who is less guilty than you are? And she says, God wants me to forgive him. I said, do you think we can have prayer and see if God can put forgiveness in your heart? And she said, let's pray. So we prayed together. We prayed together. And she let go of her bitterness, her anger and her resentment. Three weeks later, blood pressure, 116 over 75. Perfect blood pressure. So what's the point? The point is, is that whenever you think about that person who hurt you, once you consider how you and I, because of our sins and what we have done to hurt and break the heart of God, we will find that there is no comparison to what we've done to God in comparison to what others have done to us. And if we want God to forgive us, then we need to ask God to put forgiveness in our heart towards those who have done less. And you will find that God will help you overcome that bitterness, that anger and that resentment. So that's just a little key that I'll leave with you amongst many others that we can talk about in further question and answer. Amen. And final question. Dr. Gibbons speaks of health and the gospel a lot. Does my eating and drinking habits have an effect on one's salvation? And that's a very good question. And I want you to listen carefully to it because Dr. Gibbons has been doing very unordinary uh, presentations on health. He's, he's not just telling you to eat apples. He is here to help us see how the gospel and health go hand in hand. And in that, sometimes that question comes up. Does my eating and drinking habits affect my salvation? Can it affect my salvation? Well, I'll put it to you like this. Let me give it to you in the easiest way I can. Do you believe iniquity can affect one's salvation? Yes. Sure you do, because the Bible says in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. So can iniquities affect our salvation? Yes. Absolutely. Well, when you next time you get a chance, I want you to write this down. You go home and you read Ezekiel, the 16th chapter and the 49th verse. When you read Ezekiel 16 and verse 49, it says, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says pride. So in other words, pride, the Bible calls iniquity. So can pride affect our salvation? Yes. Yes. The second thing on the list, it says fullness of bread. What is fullness of bread? That's gluttony. You know what gluttony is in, in real layman's terms? Overeating. Is overeating an eating habit? Does the Bible call overeating iniquity? Can iniquity affect your salvation? 
Yes. So according to the Bible, there can come a time and place where our eating and drinking habits can actually have an effect on our walk with God and our being with him in heaven. And it's because of that that that's why God wants us to eat and drink to the glory of God. Thank you very much for all these questions. We look forward to getting more. Write down your questions. There's a question box in the back. When you leave tonight, you put your questions in that question box and we will do our best to make sure we furnish you with answers every night. a beautiful scripture song. Amen. Amen. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And I'm very thankful that we can talk about this because we're going to be studying about the law of God tonight. We're going to be going over the whole duty of man. Amen. And uh, there's much that God wants to show us. And I would like to not labor any longer or, or, or belabor the points because we have so much to cover tonight. And I just pray that you are ready to study. Are you ready to study tonight? Amen. All right. So what we're going to do is let's do as has been our custom night after night. And if you're able to, I'd like to invite you to kneel with me. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And if you can't kneel, then you just bow your heads where you are. But let us pray as we approach the Lord. Father in heaven, we are very grateful for the privilege and the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters and to press together as we study your words. We ask you to please do something very special tonight, and we ask you first for the forgiveness of our sins, and that you would truly cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Father, we're also praying that you would please purify our hearts, and that you would open our eyes and help us to behold wondrous things out of your law. And so teach us tonight and grant us your spirit, and make your words plain to our hearts, we pray. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. One of the reasons why you will find that I, I put scriptures on the screen is because we try to always make sure that everyone departs no later than uh, our 9 p.m. slot. And sometimes we try to see if we can get you out earlier. And if I put the scriptures on the screen, it makes it that much easier for the time to move. So you're going to find that if I put the scriptures on the screen, please take notes so that you can write them down. You can go back home, be good Bereans and search it out. The Bible begins by telling us a story about a couple named Adam and Eve. And when Adam and Eve were brought into existence,
The Bible lets us know something in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 25. It's actually a strange statement. Now, for this one, I want you to turn your Bibles there. And let's notice what the Bible says in Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 25, talking about the condition of Adam and Eve. When they came into the world, they were pure. They were holy people. And the Bible tells us something about the way that they stood before the Lord. And it's found in the book of Genesis, chapter 2 and verse 25. And when you're there, just please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 25, it says, and they were both what? Naked, Naked the man and his wife, and were what? Not ashamed. Not ashamed. Now, in this day and age, that's a very strange statement. Because normally, nakedness and shame go together. And even in the Bible, nakedness and shame go together. When you study the book of Isaiah 47 and verse 3, it talks about the daughters of Zion, that as they were going through the sea, God says, uncover your leg, make bare your thigh. And God says, and your nakedness shall go before you, yea, your shame shall be seen. So nakedness and shame normally go together. In Revelation 3, the Bible talks about those who are afflicted with something called Laodicea. And the Laodiceans had an issue. They thought that they were all right when they were really all wrong. And as a result of that, God says, you think you're OK and, and are rich and have need of nothing. But God says, in truth, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. But then in verse 18 of Revelation 3, God says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And then he says that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and the shame of your nakedness do not appear. So the Bible often associates nakedness and shame together. Here in Genesis 2.25, the Bible says that Adam and Eve were naked but not ashamed. Now, the reason for that is very simple. They must have had a covering of some kind. And I'll show you why that I believe that is an easy thing to deduce. Now go to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. In Genesis, the third chapter, by the time you get to verse 6, Eve is now talking to a snake. And as Eve is talking with this serpent, the Bible says in Genesis 3 and verse 6, and if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Genesis 3 and verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, it says she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And watch verse 7. Verse 7 says, And the eyes of them both were what? Opened. And what did they realize? It says now they knew that they were naked and immediately they began to sew fig leaves together so that they can make these aprons to try to cover themselves up. By the time you get to verse 10, they are in the presence of God. And the Bible says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So when you look at Genesis between chapter two and chapter three, chapter 225, Adam and Eve are naked and not ashamed. By the time you get to Genesis 3:10, now Adam and Eve are naked and ashamed and they're hiding themselves. So there's something that Adam and Eve had in Genesis 2:25 that they clearly lost by Genesis 3:10. And believe it or not, whatever they had in Genesis 2:25 that they lost by Genesis 3.10? Did you know the whole theme of the Bible is God's plan how to get it back? Yes, Amen. Literally, the whole theme from Genesis to Revelation is God's plan on how he wants to get back on man what he had in Genesis 2.25 that he lost by Genesis 3.10. So therefore, I think we need to understand what it is. So therefore, when we think about it, yes, that was the beginning. But once they fell into sin, the Bible makes it clear that an angel with a flaming sword had to banish them from the garden forever. Yes. And that was their punishment. Why? Because of a choice. Because they lost something that was very precious. And therefore, we need to find out what they lost. And I believe that the Bible gives us one of the clearest ways to find out. Here's how we can do it. If we were to go to scripture, we would consider this. Adam and Eve clearly had something on them. Something that was enabling them to be naked before God, but not ashamed. Now, think about it. Did you know that every single one of you in this room right now, you're naked? And I'm not talking spiritually. I'm talking physically. Every single one of you in this room right now are naked. But you know why you're not ashamed? Because you have a covering over your nakedness. It's called clothing. Adam and Eve, they were naked, but not ashamed. Why? Because they had a covering over them. 
There was something that was covering them that they lost by Genesis 3.10. So our mission in our study now is to find out what was it that they had. Well, here's one of your first clues. It's in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. You'll remember that the Bible says that God said, let us make man in what? Our image and our likeness. So notice that mankind, when he was made, dealing with Adam and Eve, when they were made, they were made in two things, not one. They were made in two things. What were they made in? God's image and likeness. So the first thing we learn is that Adam and Eve did not just have a mindset like God, but they actually had a physiology like God. Because the Bible says they were made in God's image. So they actually had a physiology like God while they had a likeness, a mindset like God. You understand? So therefore, if I want to find out what Adam and Eve were covered with like clothing, then all I need to do is find out what does God cover himself with like clothing? Because Adam and Eve were made in God's image. All right. So therefore, now we go to Psalms, the 104th division. In Psalms 104, verse 2, the Bible tells us about the Lord. It says, who covers thyself with what? With light as with what? A garment. So God literally covers himself with light like clothing. So that means that when Adam and Eve were made in God's image, that means Adam and Eve were covered with light like clothing. You understand? Now, might sound like a silly question, but oh, it makes a profound point. What is the purpose of light? What's the purpose of light? It removes darkness and all these things. Did you know the Bible tells us what the purpose of light is? Look at this. It's right here. Ephesians 5 and verse 14. The Bible says, for whatsoever doth make manifest is what? Light. So what's the purpose of light according to the verse? To make things what? Manifest. So the purpose of light is to make something manifest or make something known. Something that could not be seen absent from light. So when God covered Adam and Eve with light, God wanted to make something known to everybody who would behold Adam and Eve. And I wonder what light makes known. The Bible says in Micah, in the book of Micah, the seventh chapter, watch it now. It says, I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he plead my cause and execute judgment for me. He will bring me forth to the light and I shall behold his righteousness. So what does the light help us behold? Righteousness. righteousness. So when Adam and Eve were made in the beginning of time, they were covered with the light of God's righteousness. And that's why they could stand before God naked, but not ashamed. And when Genesis 3 and verse 10 kicks in, the Bible says that they chose to sin against God. And as a result of that, they lost the light or they lost righteousness. And that's why the best thing they can do was try to cover themselves up with their own self righteousness. Are you following? So right there in the beginning of time. We see that Adam and Eve were covered with the light of God's righteousness. It was God's desire to make his righteousness known all throughout the world from the shining light of Adam and Eve's garments, brothers and sisters. Now watch this. The reason why this becomes very interesting to me is because now I think we have arrived at a point where we have to ask a very serious question. And you know what that question is? We have a very serious question mark. And you know what that question is? What is righteousness? Because Adam and Eve were covered with what? Righteousness. And God wanted that righteousness to shine all throughout the world. Can you imagine that? In other words, that was the same plan that God has for you and I. Remember, whatever Adam and Eve lost is what God is trying to put back on his people. God wants to once again cover us with his righteousness. You understand? So therefore, when I think about this question, well, what is righteousness? I think that's a worthy question. Don't you agree? Yeah. 
I mean, nowadays people go around talking about what's righteous and what's not. I've, I've seen all sorts of brothers and sisters. They call themselves righteous or they call themselves righteous people. And my thing is, listen, if you do not understand righteousness from God's perspective, more than likely you're going to pervert it. So therefore, I need to understand what is righteousness, but not from the opinions of men. I need to understand it from the words of God. So therefore, what does the Bible say is righteousness? You'd be amazed to find out. The Bible says very clearly in Psalm 119, 172, it says, my tongue shall speak of thy word for all thy commandments are righteousness. All of what? All of God's commandments are righteousness. Now, the reason why I'm taking my time with this is because I don't want you to ever lose this point. Whenever you and I talk about righteousness, whenever we think about righteousness, what is it that we should be talking about and thinking about now that we understand the text? God's commandments. So righteousness and God's commandments are synonymous. They're the same. They are connected. There's no such thing as righteousness without God's commandments. Because the Bible clearly says what righteousness is. Now, the reason why this becomes important is because we're going to entertain another question. You know what this question is? If righteousness, all of God's commandments are there made up, all God's commandments are righteousness, then the next question is this. Can I make myself righteous? Can you make yourself righteous? In other words, can you and I just in and of ourselves keep God's commandments? You understand? You follow the question, right? So let's notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah 64 and verse 6, the Bible says all our what? Righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. When... You and I look up what filthy rags means in the original Hebrew. There is a time in the month that a woman goes through a cycle. And when the sister goes through that cycle, she uses some kind of napkin to capture what is coming out of her through that cycle. Do you know that when the Bible says all our righteousness are as filthy rags. The filthy rags in the Hebrew is literally God saying all of our self-righteous acts are the same as a used sanitary napkin. That's powerful. You know what? That's not just powerful. That's disgusting. But you know what? That's how God feels about any man or any woman who tries to dare think they're righteous without him. He says that individual reminds me of a used sanitary napkin. You understand? So self-righteousness is terribly offensive to God. Goes on. The Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is how many righteous? There is none righteous, no, not one. I don't care how many times you walk an old lady across the street. Doesn't matter how many homeless people we feed. There are people right now, and especially, you know, because I told you I'm, I'm from the entertainment industry. And, you know, the, the, you know, it's amazing how the hip hop artists and the R&B artists, they, they, they will put out albums that's all about self. Buy cars that's all about self. Build houses that are all about self. Everything is about self. How great, how wonderful, how powerful they are. And then they go ahead and visit a church one day or maybe make a contribution and put one gospel song on their album and they think they're helping God and his kingdom out. God says that album, that one song is like a filthy rag to me. God says, I want all of man, not some of man, not contributions. God is not interested in any of our contributions. He is fully interested in our commitments. We can find a world filled with people that want to just contribute to the cause of God. God does not need contributors. He is looking for committed people, people who will say, that's it. My life is no longer mine. This is what God is literally looking for. But there are people who think today that all I got to do is give a contribution, help somebody out, write a check here, there, drop some coins in a plate. And all of these things mean that I'm a good person. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. 
Then it goes on to say, can the Ethiopian change his skin? What do you think the answer is? No. It says, can the leopard change his spots? Can that happen? No. Then the Bible says, then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So the Bible makes it very clear that you and I, we can't keep righteousness. And what's another way of saying righteousness? God's commandments on our own. Can't happen. Righteousness is God's commandments, but you and I can't keep it on our own. We need help. So therefore, watch this. So now another question. If a man cannot obtain righteousness by works, then there's only other one. There's only one other way to get it. And that's called righteousness by faith. When a man can we have we seen that a man cannot arrive at righteousness by his own works? Have we seen that thus far? Our best works is like a filthy rag. So there's no good deed that you and I can do to make ourselves favorable in God's sight. OK, now this is powerful. You know why? Because most religions today are built upon self-righteousness. I got to take pilgrimages to certain places to please and appease God. I have to pray a certain amount of days to please and appease God. I have to offer certain sacrifices to please and appease God. There's all sorts of religious teachings in different movements today that by their works, they believe that they are meriting favor with God. If you're part of any religious movement like that, I'm telling you right now, that movement's teachings is like a filthy rag in the eyes of God. God does not accept such offerings. God says, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. So when I cannot obtain righteousness, when I cannot truly keep God's commandments by my works, then the only way I can experience true righteousness is by faith. And therefore, my question is, what is faith? Think it's a logical question? I think it's a very logical question. So let's notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, oh, I like this, too. Look at the interchangeability here. Watch this. Romans 4 and verse 5. The Bible says, but to him that worketh not, but what? Believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his what? Faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Righteousness. So what are the two words in this verse that are interchangeable? Faith and belief. To believe is to have what? Faith. faith. So belief or faith can be accounted for righteousness. righteousness. Now, watch that. Watch that. Because remember, if I can't become righteous or keep God's commandments by my own mere efforts, and boy, am I going to show you this. This is appetizer moment. The real course is about to come in a minute. So watch what I'm saying to you, because I want to set the ground this way so that you can understand all the other stuff that I'm going to share with you. And it'll make a lot more sense. This is why God methodically told me, start it out this way. Put the standard right in front of them and let it glide all throughout the study. So therefore, Adam and Eve, when they were made in the beginning, they were made and covered with God's righteousness. Oh, they were commandment keepers, but it was through God's power in them. But then when they fell into sin, they lost righteousness. They were no longer commandment keepers. They were commandment breakers. And they put aprons on, which represented they tried to cover themselves up. And God says, no, 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 that's not going to work. And that's why if you read, if you go, if you go further in Genesis 3, by Genesis 3.21, God literally looks at their aprons and says, uh-uh. And literally God takes a coat and covers them up again. So Adam and Eve at one time were commandment keepers, bearing the light of God's righteousness, but then they broke righteousness, yea, they broke God's commandments. And as a result of that, sin was birthed. Then God says, all right, well, he says, well, I have a plan. God says, I am going to again make you righteous, but this time it can't happen by your own mere efforts. We're too weak and we're too sinful to accomplish it. It can't happen. And I'm going to show it to you clear as day, even though we saw the verses already. So therefore, when I cannot become righteous again by my own works, then the only other option is to become righteous by faith. So when I look at faith, what is faith? Faith is simply believing God. Amen. You follow that so far? You follow so far? Yes. All right. So faith is believing God. 
So when I think about righteousness by faith, I am thinking about how I can once again have a life in harmony with God and his commandments, but I'm going to have to put my faith, belief, or trust in someone else to make it possible outside of myself. Because we saw what happens with all our righteousness, all our works. You follow? So therefore, this is the concept that is known as righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is God's plan on how he's going to bring a bunch of lawless, commandment-breaking people, and he's going to draw them unto himself, by which they're going to exercise belief and trust and faith in someone else. His name is Jesus. That will enable them to experience two things. Oh, righteousness by faith is made up of two beautiful things. You ready to see it? Go to the book of Romans chapter 3. Oh, watch this. This is the message of the hour, believe it or not. There's some people today that think they're teaching the third angel, but they're not necessarily teaching it because it's void of Christ, their righteousness. So the Bible tells us in Romans, the third chapter. And when you get there, you just let me know by saying amen. Amen. Now watch what the Bible says. It's it's beautiful how it comes out. The Bible says something here that I believe is very powerful. I'm going to start at verse 20. Watch the verse carefully with me. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall how much flesh? No flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there's no work that I can do that can make me right with God. You understand that, right? All right. Well, look at what it says next. It says in verse 22, it says, oh, 21, it says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by what? Faith of Jesus Christ. Read the next five words with me. Unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference. Now watch this. I'm going to put that verse up on the screen here. It says the righteousness of God. What is righteousness? All of God's commandments. Now watch. It says even the righteousness of God, which is by what? Faith. Faith. That's why I told you you can't get it by works. So we only can receive it by Faith. faith. It says the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. So again, the faith has to be focused on who? Jesus Jesus Christ. Then it says, by faith of Jesus Christ unto how many people? So in other words, Jesus is willing to offer us righteousness and he's willing to offer it to how many people? All. So can there be bigotry in true religion? No, No, there cannot. So then it says unto all, but what does it say next? And upon all. I learned something about Jesus. When Jesus says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, I learned he was not joking. Sometimes you got to pay attention to the words that's being used in the scripture. The Bible says righteousness through Jesus is available to all men, but you have to, there's a word that comes up. You have to what? Believe. Believe. So when I believe, it says that the righteousness of Christ is put upon me. It's like, you know, you got a jacket. You know, I got a jacket right now. And I got a jacket. And I take my jacket off and let's say you're cold or you're absent of something that you need that my jacket can provide. So you make known to me your need. You say, I am cold. I say unto you, would you like to be warm? You say, yes. I say, I am offering you warmth. Will you accept it? You say, yes, I will accept it. So I take off my jacket and I put my jacket upon you. What did you do to earn me putting my jacket upon you? Nothing. Nothing. All you did was you expressed your need for it and was willing to accept it. You understand? So the first phase of righteousness by faith is God saying you're lawless. You have broken my commandments. There is nothing available to you except one thing, and that's your proper payment. And the proper payment for sin is death. 
So you say, Lord, I don't want to die. Well, God says, well, there's only one way you can avoid it. God says, I sent my son and I allowed him to die the death you were supposed to die. So you can live the life he was supposed to live. God says, if you accept this atonement that was made for you and are willing to live a life completely submitted to my will going forward, God says, I will take my righteous robe and I will put it upon you and literally look at you as if you always kept my commandments. This is called justification by faith. Now, what happens after? Do I just simply say, well, praise the Lord, I got it upon me. No, it goes deeper than that. Because now in Romans chapter 8, notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, look at Romans 8. The Bible says it right here. And you can turn, it, you can turn there if you like. We're going to Romans chapter 8. And now we're looking at verse 4. The Bible says in Romans the 8th chapter and the 4th verse, it says that the righteousness of the what? Law might be fulfilled, how? In us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Wow, that's another dynamic. So the first phase of my experience in righteousness or keeping God's commandments is I look at my life, I say, man, my life was a life of commandment breaking. But when I look at the life of Jesus, can I show you something about the life of Jesus? Go to John 15. Go to John 15. In John, the 15th chapter, let me show you the testimony of the life of Jesus. Very different from yours and my testimony. When you look back at your testimony and the truth of the matter is, is that I don't even have to know you, but I can speak under.